it's very common for, for us to hear that 400,000 people a year die from weighing too much in this country. And that came from a report issued by some researchers at the Centers for Disease Control uh, in the 2004 issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association. And at the time, there were headlines trumpeting everywhere that obesity was soon to overtake smoking as the number one cause of preventable death in this country. Uh, the head of the CDC, Julie Gerberding, went before Congress and issued big warnings. Uh, and there was a big uproar over the number of deaths that were to occur. There were two problems with that report, one of which came from the fact that they were using data that were from the early 1970s, and they hadn't updated their data in really 30 years. The second problem came in their way of calculating the number of deaths. Basically, what they did was divide their survey samples between people who were obese and people who are not obese, and then basically looked at rates of death. Now, if you were obese and you died from a snake bite, they would say that it was your obesity that was causing your death, not the snake bite. Uh, and this was part of a little statistical hanky-panky on their part uh, that would be very questionable in terms of its assumptions, that, assuming that everybody who died who was of that weight range was dying because of their weight. Nevertheless, despite that, and despite some computational errors in, in the report too, it went ahead and some, for some reason or another cleared both CDC channels and JAMA channels and was published. Why did the CDC inflate the numbers of deaths attributable to obesity? I think it's all about funding and bureaucratic mission. When I talk to a few CDC officials, they're constantly preoccupied about how much money the government uh, or Congress is going to allot for them for the next year. And they're constantly worried about getting their funding cut. Now, if you're an organization like the Centers for Disease Control, one way you tell Congress that you need to increase our funding is by saying that there are all these health problems that are out there and by creating health problems. And by being able to argue that obesity was a big health risk and that the CDC was the government organization that should be at the front line at combating this health risk, it gives them a very strong rationale and motivation for then increasing their funding out outcomes. So there's no coincidence, for example, that the article that erroneously said 400,000 people a year were dying from being too fat was co-authored by the director of the CDC, who then a month later was before Congress making testimony about the appropriations that the CDCs would require to combat the issue of obesity. In fact, if you look at who was on the board of the National Institute of Health Report, you'll find that most of these were obesity experts, people, medical experts who spend their lives doing research on the causes and consequences of obesity. Now, most of these people, including the, the chair, Xavier P. Sonnier, are heavily subsidized by the weight loss industry. New, most of them have had, uh, received numerous research grants, serve on various boards, have received various types of funding or awards from various pharmaceutical and other weight loss companies. The conflict of interest between obesity researchers and the weight loss industry is large and problematic. There is a tight interlocking relationship among executives of weight loss companies, among obesity researchers, and among government health officials around the idea that obesity is a health problem, and it serves each of these interests very well. For example, a lot of weight loss companies want to produce diet pills. Now, most diet pills have pretty onerous side effects. In order to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration in order to uh, have these drugs reach the public market, they have to show that the benefits of these drugs outweigh the consequences. And the way that they can show that the benefits of these drugs outweigh the consequences is by saying that obesity is a real health problem and by inflating the numbers of people who are overweight or obese or inflating the, the correlational statistics between obesity or body weight and all of these other health outcomes. If you look at the scientific evidence linking body weight, morbidity, and mortality, um, we find that there is in fact very inconclusive evidence linking that somebody with a body mass index anywhere up to a body mass index of 35, and that would be say around 250, 260 pounds for a six foot tall man, is at any health risk you know, associated from their weight. There's just very little evidence that that's the case, and particularly for women with higher BMIs, even more so than men. The relationship between BMI and mortality uh, is a U-shape relationship. What we typically find is that people with the shortest lifespans tend to be at the ends of the BMI spectrum, i.e. people with the lowest body weights and people with the highest body weights. What we don't really know is why that's the case. In fact, one could argue, based on recent data, that there are more people who die from weighing too little than do from weighing too much. Now, this, this begins to show why weight is such an inappropriate barometer of somebody's health. Because we're not really concerned about all the thousands of Americans who are dying from weighing too little. There is some concern about anorexia and bulimia, but not nearly as much as there is, for example, about the obesity epidemic. 
Um, but this shows that, for example, how we choose to look at the statistics and how we choose to look at the figures are fueled a lot more by our cultural prejudices and by framing that's done by the diet industry and the pharmaceutical industry than, in fact, I think the scientific facts behind body weight, mortality, and morbidity. If we think about most diseases that are attributable to obesity, take, for example, heart disease. Most people think that, well, one of the big problems with being too fat is that it puts all, puts all this pressure on your heart and on your heart's arteries, and it clogs your heart's arteries, and it causes heart disease and death. In fact, there's almost no evidence whatsoever linking body weight with uh, heart, your heart arteries. Uh, and in fact, um, there are some clinical pathologists here who have done autopsies on obese corpse and finds that, you know, their hearts are perfectly fine. They're just like the hearts of people at normal range rates. Uh, and so there's this big misconception, for example, that somehow or another weight is causing heart disease. We don't really have any clear evidence that weight itself is a causal factor, that excess fatty tissue causes excess strain on the heart. One of the big problems of making weight a barometer of health and fitness is, is that it simply says that if someone is thin, no matter how fit they are, they're healthier than somebody who is fat. When in fact, the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly conclusive that people who are fit and active are healthier no matter what their body size is. If you take, a, 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 say, somebody who's 240 pounds and active and fit, as opposed to somebody who's 190 pounds and not active and not fit, the 240 pound person is going to be much, much healthier. The problem with linking obesity to most diseases is much like saying that well, the real problem with lung cancer is bad breath or smelly clothes rather than bl blaming cigarettes, i.e., we're blaming an associated symptom rather than an underlying cause of these health conditions. And why are we blaming these symptoms? Well, it's very profitable for certain groups in our society to treat these symptoms. Most diet industry representatives will acknowledge that your typical or very successful diet pill will only produce about a 10% weight loss in your average person. Now, if we think about a 10% weight loss, that's not very much. If someone who's 300 pounds, who most people would consider an obese person, uh, 300 pounds, uh, a 10% weight loss is only 30 pounds. It's only going to bring them down to 270. By the government's standards, that's not going to put them in any kind of improved health. So what type of person wants to lose 10% of their weight? Well, it's typically a person who's around 150, 145 pounds. Now, who's 150 or 145 pounds who wants to lose that amount of weight? It's not men, it's women. And what we're seeing here is the effort to market what is ostensibly a cosmetic product, i.e. weight loss pills, as a health product. And this is part of the problem with the obesity epidemic. Given the fact that we do not have a safe or effective mechanism for most Americans to lose weight, telling most Americans that they need to be thin in order to be healthy, irrespective of how they get thin, I think sends a very dangerous message and encourages people to engage in crash diets, to adopt dangerous procedures like bariatric surgery, to take dangerous diet pills or, or diet drugs, often, which oftentimes have very onerous side effects, that all of these factors may actually be causing more harm than good by telling people thin equals health.